you geeks! I finally, finally returned to The Witcher. I reviewed the first book in this series back in early 2020, and I liked it. But it had the misfortune of being the last book I read before The Emperor's Soul when I got sucked into the Cosmere. Despite my best intentions, I never got back to the series. Until now. Also, coincidentally, Witcher Season 2 is dropping on Netflix soon, and I needed to prepare. The Sword of Destiny is the second collection of short stories which serve as prequels to Sapkowski's main Witcher saga. Say what you will about Sanderson having three prologues in The Way of Kings, but at least his first book in the series is the first book in the series. Actually, my ire is not at Sapkowski, but at Audible's, for a lack of a better word, shelving. They successfully sold me Blood of Elves as the next book in the series before I did my own research and found out that I needed to read this book first. Fool me once, strike one. But fool me twice, strike three. In general, I liked The Sword of Destiny even better than I remember liking The Last Wish. Though it varies from story to story, which I will be happy to break it down for you in my spoilers section. Unlike The Last Wish, The Sword of Destiny doesn't have a framing story, but the stories are set more or less chronologically over the course of a few years? The connecting threads are too sparse to be called a plot until the last two stories, but as a collection, it hit me right in the feels in a way that I didn't believe short stories could do. Since it lacks a conventional plot, you probably already know I am doing my 10 Things Style review. Each story gets a spoilerific thought or two as I try to make sense of this literary experience. In Medius Res. Sapkowski makes excellent use of this trope in several stories, but none finer than how he starts The Bonds of Reason, with Geralt down a mine and the townsfolk all gathered round. It's the perfect grungy and bleak setting that captures the tone of this world so well, without being overbearingly grimdark. When the show adapted this scene, I can't help but draw comparisons. It's like two guys standing out in front of a cave on a sunny day. And that really captures the essence of how Netflix adapted these tales. Back to the story, Geralt killing monsters off screen just further digs into the point that killing monsters is the least interesting part of Geralt's life. Sapkowski often writes them as side quests to be glossed over between the real drama. And boy, does Geralt get real drama. Epic foreshadowing. The Bounds of Reason is not a framing story, yet it does hold all the following stories together. It's a dragon hunt that covers Geralt and Yennefer's sad love life, the place of mythical creatures in a modernizing world. Should they be left alone, as Dora Gray argues, or are they capable of adapting? There's a noble knight who epically fails, a selfish king, and brutal mercenaries, who, in true Sapkowski fashion, are the true monsters, attacking the competition before attacking the dragon. Yet also, in true Sapkowski fashion, the tale ends with the golden dragon the mythical aberration adopting an abandoned child of its race. We see that the little green dragon was Three Jackdaw's treasure and his destiny. Now if only Geralt can find one of those. Ice Queen. Is this a kissing book? Sapkowski turns the original fairy tale about childhood friendship into a love triangle with Yennefer unable to make up her mind. Three in the bed and the little one said, if you want to be wed, make up your mind. Poor Geralt. 
This sad Snow Queen tale is where love does not conquer all because none of the characters know what love is. Or if they do know, they just aren't saying anything. We see that love is certainly more than unicorn rides. Without love, the best Geralt and Yennefer can settle for is self-preservation and leaving the other behind. This story clearly shows why Geralt and Yennefer did not work as a couple, yet I'm supposed to ship them for the rest of the series. Okay, sure. At least Geralt's self-preservation led him to punching one idiot in the face and not sinking to the level of that whining sorcerer. <gasps> Yay! Conservation of Magical Creatures The question was floated several times in this book, what happens to magical creatures as humanity moves in? First with the dragon fleeing from humans, then with the garbage monster thriving in a dung heap. It's worse. Each mirrors Geralt's own perspective on his place in humanity and are quite grim. Enter the halfling and a Doppler and things start to look up. Doodoo the Doppler is able to be accepted, if not completely by humans, then at least by halflings. Sapkowski shows us magical creatures succeeding in assimilation, giving Geralt three choices, flee, fester, or thrive. Geralt doesn't really choose any by the story's end, and I suspect this will be an ongoing theme. Identity theft. I do like the concept of an identity theft, which leaves the victim richer. Sapkowski excellently plays it like a hangover-style mystery. What happened last night? Dainty Beaverbelt was too angry to ask the right questions at first. Then, as the yarn gets unraveled, the riches pour in. The only persons who have lost from Doodoo's exploits are the Doppler people themselves who were maliciously misrepresented in Netflix's adaptation. Sure, there's a throwaway line about how the one shown is not like other Dopplers. You're different to other Dopplers. You're not good-natured or helpful, are you? But that dumb psycho couldn't stay in character for one storming day. Except you have arthritis. You hate the cold, and you always said Skellig was where you came from, but Sintra was your home with us. I highly doubt they had Dudu's intelligence and ability to manipulate the market, or Chappelle's ability to become, well, Chappelle. The Dopplers have had their identity stolen by Netflix, and I will not stand for it. Little Mermaid. Unlike The Last Wish, where every Disney princess was her own monster, Sapkowski's twist is that Ariel, I mean Sheernet, got to be the heroine of her own story. In the middle of the story, when they were guessing what the monster could be, I wondered if Sapkowski would pull from his old playbook. But Geralt this time was right. It was not the princess. She even gets to be the hero, saving Geralt from monsters of the deep. She is only guilty of having relationship standards and being a very practical mermaid. In the end, she decided that she would sacrifice her tail to pursue her relationship with the Duke. I'm not certain he was worth it, but we only see the Duke at his worst. I suppose Sheernet is also the crowning achievement of mythical assimilation with humanity by becoming human. And Sapkowski doesn't treat it as a tragedy, at least not compared with the story's other tragedy. Little Siren. Kissing again. Do we have to hear the kissing part? It's not really the kissing I mind. What bothers me is the sullen tension. Sapkowski writes that very well, well enough to give me secondhand embarrassment for everyone involved. 
I was even more embarrassed when Geralt's little sacrifice was to give Essie Davern a one-night stand, which she apparently treasures to the end of her short days. I guess this is in keeping with the true spirit of the Little Mermaid, innocent girl falls for man who loves someone else. That Sapkowski made the man sympathetic is a testament to his writing prowess, but in my estimation, just because Geralt is sympathetic does not make him any less of a cad for encouraging Essie after he knew he was not interested. Undulate. Murphy Napier is famous for hating the word undulate. I had no opinion until I read this book. Fields undulate, smoke undulates, lots of things undulate that really shouldn't. Say what again? Say what again? I dare you. I wonder if the original Polish word has a broader connotation. Or is this just another way Sapkowski expresses his trick of using a highly technical term instead of poetic expression? That trick works when talking about anatomy or rock formations. But fields in English do not technically undulate, so it comes off as a poetic misfire. Dryads are hardcore. Lady Ithne and her dryads are everything Geralt and the witchers are accused of being. Hard, unfeeling, inhuman. Though dryads traditionally aren't strictly human, it appears that more and more dryads are just drugged up humans, much like witchers. So, Geralt gets to be the comparatively soft, caring father figure to an adorable Ciri. We get to see Geralt be surprised at finding his destiny and see it immediately put to the test at Lady Ithne's hard hands. Doubting the deeper magic at work right before his eyes, Geralt refuses to entangle the adorable Ciri into his fate. Although, Ciri haplessly thwarting all the Dryad's plans shows that she has great witcher potential. It's even more impressive since these Dryads are clearly powerful and deadly beings. Destiny. There is not a thing wrong with the story much more. We start with a reminder of just how terrifying Geralt is when he's on the job of saving hapless civilians, and how that cruel irony often results in him being spurned by the people he saves. Though not this time, Sapkowski uses Geralt's drug convalescence to reconcile Geralt with the four women who are key to his destiny. Well, five if we're counting Roach, and we should. God must have made him just for me. Do you believe in Catholic destiny? Yennefer and Geralt may have forgiven each other for not being able to love, though I'm still not seeing why they make a good couple. I'm also not sure if Yennefer's advice on destiny was good, since it was Geralt's justification for spurning Ciri, not wanting any child to be dogged by death like he is. As if death does not already dog Ciri's steps for being a child of destiny herself. Though Geralt could have misinterpreted Yennefer's advice as he clearly misinterprets the circumstances of his birth. I'm not a child of surprise. I was just born of a woman who everyone thought was barren. Nothing surprising about that, not at all. Destiny is something we've invented because we can't stand the fact that everything that happens is accidental. I was not expecting or ready for Geralt to be reunited with his mother. I cried. She certainly made hard choices, but I think she made the right ones. Compared to Geralt refusing to, quote, endanger the child, 
that put Siri squarely in death's path. Death, it appears, is not so terrible as she is a lovely woman. Geralt meeting death was, again, a scene I did not expect. I was still trying to wrap my head around Yennefer's apparent death, although I knew she could not be. Sapkowski's choice to never say she was dead and just let Geralt's pessimism and refusal to face truth carry the darkest implications. You lied. Oh, I, I implied. That was the best fake out death I've ever read, while Ceres was above average. She is Geralt's final Lady of Destiny. Their embrace in the field was beautiful and made me cry for the third time in this short, short book. It's so small, yet so powerful. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you would like to see more. Your patronage is greatly appreciated.